Professor Chandrasekhar made his initial discovery, the Chandrasekhar Limit as it's called, when he was just 19 and on a ship setting off for England. When he later presented it before the Royal Astronomical Society, it was attacked and ridiculed by Eddington, one of the most eminent scientists of the time. Nobody there or later spoke up in defense of an obscure 24-year-old Indian. A lesser man would have been destroyed. Chandrasekhar stayed friends with Eddington and calmly carried on with his own scientific interests as a fellow at Trinity and later as a professor at Chicago University. Over the years he wrote a number of books which have come to be regarded as classics, not just for their content but also for the clarity and elegance of his writing. The Nobel Prize came in 1983 when he was 73 years old, a footnote almost to his other achievements. Professor Chandrasekhar grew up in Madras in a family that set great store by intellectual attainment. His father's younger brother, C. V. Raman, received the 1930 Nobel Prize for Physics. Chandrasekhar was a brilliant student of physics and mathematics with a keen interest in literature and music. He got his master's degree from the Madras Presidency College and his doctorate from Trinity College, Cambridge. But we've come full circle now, so I'll let him tell us the story of his life in science, the satisfaction it brought him, as well as the regret. This was the last time he ever appeared on film, so we are very fortunate we had the privilege of meeting him. I was an undergraduate. I knew very little physics, but the physics which I used was something which I could have read, and I was curious what would happen if that was applied to stars. And I found this limit. But I don't see that it tells anything about my my future work. I mean, I could have stopped at that point and, and the discovery would be there. But if I am what I am in the sense that I have lived in science for 60 years and pursued science, that to me is far more important. The important thing is, no matter what other people say, you value certain things you do because of your personal reactions, not because somebody else says it is good. No matter, uh, even if it involves getting a prize of $100,000. There is nothing very much to my life. It can be said in three sentences. I mean, I left India in 1930, came back, six years later and married a girl who, was, who had waited all that time, came to Chicago and lived happily ever after. <laughs> well, anyhow. I was uh, born in 1910 and uh, we left Lahore after some six years and we were in Allahabad for two years and we finally settled down in Madras in 1918. My father taught me English, arithmetic and so on by himself and my mother t taught me Tamil. This home education was really more intense. Our educational upbringing was purely by our parents. Mother used to teach and father used to teach. And our house was more like an educational institution than a home. Even when in college, yes. we had no freedom to tune the radio and listen to film music or anything. If we hear the footsteps of our father returning from the we just walk, it off. we'll switch it off and run off to our rooms.
grandfather, of course, was a professor of mathematics, and they still have one of his books which he used to read. I mean, my grandfather's book with his signature. I still have it. So the the intellectual background was there. There was this family tradition, and which was sort of unspoken but there. You take Raman, for example. People tell me, weren't you inspired by him? But the fact is that uh, I didn't see very much of him. I did go to Calcutta in 1928 when the Raman effect was discovered and was there uh, with his students. But he was far too busy for me to uh, participate. And moreover, I mean, already at that time, I knew the kind of science qualitatively, and that is very different from my uncle. So, as scientists, uh, we are, in some ways, in our motivation, poles apart. But of course, I developed a very strong attachment to my mother. She was uh, very ambitious. For example, uh, the Indian father at that time always wanted their son to get high in government service, uh, apply for ICS and so on. But I didn't want to do that and my mother encouraged me not to be persuaded by my father so that in some sense she had a greater understanding of what I wanted to be. My father almost puritanically. <laughs> of course he knew that uh, even uh, as a, in school I was reading things like calculus and so on uh, very much before I was required to, you see. I wanted to go into mathematics honors. He dissuaded me and practically uh, compelled me, that is too strong a word, but still uh, put enormous pressure that I should take physics because according to him, physics is more likely to have a future from the point of view of obtaining position. So I took physics, but then it happened that uh, by the end of two, uh, two years I had already had a paper of mine published in the Royal Society. So my father realized at that time that he should not put any further pressure on me to proceed to the Indian Civil Service or something like that. I got a Government of India scholarship and that meant I, I went to England. My real scientific inspiration came when I met Sommerfeld and so on. And in England, of course, the, the first time I was in Cambridge, there were some very, very great men there. J.J. Thompson, Hardy, Littlewood. Of course, I knew, saw them all only at a distance. I didn't know them personally. I got to know them personally after I became a fellow. So in some ways, uh, the two years after my fellowship was the happiest in that sense. But then, unfortunately, there was this controversy with Eddington which uh, threw a blanket over everything for a while. It's a very, very simple discovery. And just a simple observation. It was fortunate for me that uh, a simple idea which can be taken essentially by one who has just come out from college. And of course, you see, it attained the glamour which it did only because it was involved in a controversy with Eddington. When I was doing that work and 
preparing it for publication. He used to come to my office, almost in my rooms in college, ever so often. But then, quite to my surprise, it turns out that all this time he has been working to show that I was wrong. And it came as a total surprise. And, well, I mean, that is certainly true, but, uh, but I never lost my friendship for him. Suppose Eddington, instead of uh, finding, finding that I was wrong, had instead said, what you have done is very important, and, so, and said so publicly. Given Eddington's reputation, it would have made me instantly a very well-known person. And I don't know whether that sudden prominence would have been helpful to me in the future. Very often a person can, can uh, rather, uh, let me put it this way, suppose you make a, an important discovery uh, in the sense that it is immediately appreciated and gives you renown and prestige, then it can in the long run harm you because you are diverted from doing science to enjoying, quote unquote, your position in science. And you lose your uh, motivation to continue doing science. The way I wanted to do science motivated to not make discoveries in the conventional way, but to master a, a, an area and get a view of it, a perspective of it, which is my own. I think on the whole, uh, the fact that uh, I worked in relative obscurity for a very long time helped me in the long run, you see. You know that his, uh, his plan for his own research consists of working on a particular subject for a period of time and writing a book on the subject. And in many cases, that book has turned out to be definitive. So um, he has made contributions over the years in science, which are known very well among scientists, but not so well to the general public, perhaps. And um, the reason that he's been able to do this, I think, uh, aside from um, mental agility, is enormous um, devotion and persistence in scientific matters. But I think that uh, there is, in fact, no correlation between a great discovery and the greatness of the mind which is behind it. If you take a man like Newton, anybody who reads Newton knows that his understanding of science is 100 times yours. So there can be no question. But if you take the contemporaries, you can point out, I mean, the great discoveries. Let us take an arbitrary criterion, whether you get the Nobel Prize or not. They are often given for a discovery. But uh, there are many of them who will not be considered great by any standards. It is true that uh, uh, I was in the presence of great scientists for a very long time. In Cambridge, for example, I mean, I remember collaborating with these great men with regard to real scientific influence on me, I have benefited more by the association with students. I mean, uh, I've had some very good students in my time, some who have become quite well known. At least there are four or five of my students who are uh, in the National Academy now. I think that is the most important thing for a scientist. 
not being in the presence of a great man. What can you do with that? You admire the man, but whereas with young students who are exceptionally good, you interact with them, and that interaction produces a much la more lasting influence than uh, uh, just briefly encountering a great man. One does not do science by just being inspired. The fact that he is uh, from a, a distant country with a culture quite different and uh, he is, I think, a lonely man and uh, I think this affects him in many ways but probably also has meant that he has done a service to science which other people would never do as a consequence. We had several recordings of this, but this is the one which, this is the best. Uh, which you selected. That I selected, yes. Yeah. You're going to play the last side? Yes, I want to be sure that I play the right side. So that it can be done. I do know there are many, many things I would have found pleasurable and satisfying in personal ways. I mean, to think that something you wrote may be known 50 years from now, what good does it do me? I mean, whereas if I spend some time hearing music or going to nice places, that, uh, nice places and enjoying the scenery as we have done sometimes, in the end, it might have been better for me personally. I don't know, you see. But the essential point is, life is irreversible. A far more serious question, which I had to address myself, was, is it justified that I demand of someone else a sacrifice uh, to go along my own uh, desires? No, uh, I, uh, if this is going to be my lot, to be the wife of a scientist, then I took that as a challenge. And first of all, I had to take care of my husband, do everything I can for him, so that he can do his work. It would have been nice if he could have had some life together, uh, apart from his science. But somehow I committed myself to, to my husband and I'm quite happy the way I have committed myself to him. And uh, I'm not, if you ask me, would I like to lead a different life if I had had the choice? I don't think so. I think uh, I'm quite satisfied the way things have gone. And we have really uh, got a lot out of each other. And uh, that is my satisfaction, that is his satisfaction. I don't think he has changed at all. He continues to be the same man in spirit, in his endeavors, in his outlook, in his everything, just as he was before. He is not by any means traditional at all, but I should think he is a very true Indian, Indian in spirit and in background. It's very difficult to explain. I've been here in the, uh, Europe so long, but when I go to India, out of the first few hours, I feel that I have never left, the, never left the country. I feel so at home. What is it which does it to you? I, I, I don't know. 
I have always quoted Nehru in this connection. The, the, the roots of an Indian grow deep in the ancient soil and though the future beckons, the past holds back. I mean, so, I, I never, never felt uh, I became a stranger to India at any time. I have reason to believe that now, even after his Nobel Prize, getting the Nobel Prize, he is feeling lonely. That uh, the spirit of loneliness again he is feeling back again, and he has been lonely all these years. And after all, uh, I think it is a rule. It is a, it is fairly the, uh, happening that most great spirits of lonely in spirit. You, my friend, fortune was not kind to me in this world. Whither I go, I go. I wander in the mountains. I seek rest for my lonely heart. I journey to the homeland, to my resting place. I shall never again go seeking the far distance. My heart is still and awaits its hour.